Great. Well, uh, welcome today. I want to say hello to everybody. It's nice to see such a nice crowd uh, for an event here in the library. Uh, my name is Eric Nordberg. I'm the Dean of Libraries uh, here at the university. I would be remiss if I didn't point out my uber boss, our new interim chancellor, Dr. Phil Cavalier, who has joined us today, uh, but so many others in the room. This was actually a project that Phil and I cooked up, gosh, it's almost two years ago now. Um, as many people know, uh, this university is largely known as a teaching university, and we do a really fine job of educating uh, primarily undergraduate students, but an increasing number of graduate students as well. Uh, but I think very often people neglect to understand that each of our faculty also participate in research of various types. And so our idea with this series was to invite faculty to come and talk about their research. And as we've seen over the course of the last couple of years, it's very diverse. And I think you'll find today's will add to that diversity in a very interesting uh, way as well. Um, I want to be sure that folks know that if you need them, restrooms are back down that way. For t people tuning into the live stream, you'll know where your restrooms are. <clears throat> and I want to also highlight the next couple of events in the series. Uh, on Tuesday, April the 4th, uh, we'll have a panel discussion about the scholarship of teaching and learning. Uh, Bonnie uh, Daniel, who's here with our uh, division of, uh, uh, excuse me, information technology and instructional technology, is going to talk about a project that was funded here through a Title III grant uh, a few years ago, and to talk about the enduring impact that that's having here at the uh, University of Tennessee at Martin. And then in May, just after commencement, uh, we'll be downtown at the Martin Public Library on uh, Tuesday, May the 9th. And Mike Gibson, uh, who's in uh, the Ag Geosciences program, uh, will give an overview of his research uh, largely around fossil collections at the Coon Creek uh, Science Center. And for those that haven't heard, this would be a, one, maybe one of your last chances to see Mike in ap action because he's going to be retiring at the end of this year. So uh, we like to do some of these events uh, outside of this building, particularly those that we know are going to reach a general audience. Not that they all wouldn't, but uh, if you haven't been to Coon Creek and stood in the creek and dug up fossils and then get to take them home, which we did this year, is a lot of fun. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind. I know that they've advertised some of their open and Saturdays for the public if you haven't been down there. Our thanks to uh, IT Services who helps with our live stream of these events. My appreciations to our speaker for his willingness to be streamed and recorded. Uh, if you find this interesting, you'll be able to go to the web link that was advertised with the talk and always play back the video if you want to or share that uh, to others. And hopefully folks will continue to attend these events in person. I think a lot of the fun is in the interplay in the audience before and after the event. So uh, please plan to return. But that's the introductory stuff for our event. I'd like to also give a little bit of an introduction to our speaker, uh, Dr. Nathan Howard. Uh, he's in the Department of History uh, and Philosophy here at the uh, University of Tennessee at Martin. Uh, he's been here since 2006. Uh, he teaches upper-level courses uh, along some of the topics that we're going to hear today, the classical wor uh, world of Greece and Rome, church history, uh, and late antiquity. Uh, but he also conducts survey courses at the other end on World Civ. Uh, so a lot of our undergraduate students get to know Dr. Howard uh, early in their careers here at UT Martin. Um, his primary research field is church history, and that's what we're going to hear about today. Uh, he's got a, a real emphasis on the culture of writing at that time. I really wanted to promote this event as, uh, as a cosplay event because it sounds like these, uh, uh, these letter writers were all kind of playing roles with each other virtually, uh, but I don't think they had cosplay back then. It just appears when you see their pictures. <clears throat> Um, I also want to point out that uh, uh, Dr. Howard has traveled extensively uh, to do research on these topics uh, and has also been supported by a variety of grants, fellowships around the world. You may have seen some of those mentioned. Um, I also want to thank our Office of Research and Sponsored Programs, uh, which also provides support for our faculty to travel uh, to do that kind of research. Uh, I wanted to add just one little tidbit that might surprise you if you don't know Dr. Howard. From 2006 to 2015, he was also an assistant coach for our cross-country team. Uh, so a little sidebar. Our faculty do a little bit of everything here. Uh, but without, uh, without further ado, put your hands together and please welcome Dr. Nathan Howard.
Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dr. Nordberg, and certainly Dr. Cavalier. Uh, Dr. Cavalier, I saw him just a second ago, but uh, oh, he's front row. Thank you both, uh, not only for inviting me to participate in this research series, but also thank you for starting the research series. Is it turned down or it's turned on? Let's see, it's got the green light. Let's see. Michael, can I borrow you for a second? Can you hear it now? Is that better? Testing. Hmm. Sorry, sir. No, you're fine. Yeah, try that. Is that better? Testing. Is that better? Yeah. Sam, hear me? Oh, all right. We're good to go. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Nordberg. Thank you, uh, also, Dr. Cavalier. Uh, for the invitation and also just for holding the research series. I've already enjoyed some of the, the benefits of that the past uh, two years. And also, before I forget, I also want to uh, reiterate uh, my appreciation to uh, various departments, certainly the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs uh, helped make this project possible over the years, and certainly the Department of History and Philosophy. I saw Dr. Alexander I'm, I'm somewhere, uh, I know, uh, oh, there you are, Dr. Alexander. Thank you for your support as well. I could thank a lot of people, but for Tom's sake, I want us to go ahead and get right into the program. And for starters, uh, I want us to, to, to note this. So you may be wondering, the title today is Bishops and Verbal Sparring in Late Antiquity. And so you may be wondering, okay, why are a picture of a couple of nude Greek wrestlers starting the presentation? And you may think, okay, Dr. Howard really went, he went for a stretch of trying to find the, the ideal image. But I hope by the end of our talk today, I hope we'll understand that the bishops we're studying today, uh, the Cappadocians, not only would they not have found this offensive, but they would have definitely have, uh, they would have appreciated and this image and the ideals behind it. I hope to, to make that point as we go along. Uh, but to get into our discussion uh, today, You can tell I am a scholar of the ancient world. <laughs> this, <laughs> this, you had upside this, down, sir. I had upside. Yeah. All right, there you go. <laughs> All right. So, some people, some people study. Some people truly go back in time, and I have been in the fourth century, the better part of the past several years, and I think that's uh, I pretty much live back there half the time. But to start off, just background: the fourth century Eastern Roman Empire. It's what we typically, scholars today, usually refer to this just as the, the Byzantine Empire. Now, now, here's Rome, and I'm just going to give you, hopefully, this is going to be, be background before we can actually start talking about the letters today. But here's the Roman Empire, roughly around the year 100, and what happens is around the year 300, uh, Emperor Constantine comes into power. And I would say most of us have probably heard of Emperor Constantine. If anyone studied much of Roman history, he is one of the... the the emperors that most people, if they don't know anything else, they may have heard of Constantine. And Constantine, in the year 313, he and, and a co-emperor legalized Christianity at what was called the, called the Edict of Milan. And the aftermath of the Edict of Milan uh, is going to, first of all, of course, legalize Christianity, but Constantine will go much further than just legalizing Christianity. And so from this point forward, Constantine is actually going to delegate a lot of administrative responsibilities to clergy, Christian, Christian clergy across the Eastern Roman Empire or Byzantine Empire. Uh, he will also give certain legal, even financial privileges to the Christian clergy. And so it's going to create somewhat of a watershed between the Christian church pre-Constantine and certainly the Christian church that will come in the aftermath. It's going to be a real game changer uh, in that regard. And as we talk about this, and by the way, as a side note, one of the reasons it's called the Byzantine Empire is because it's during Constantine's rule, around the year 330, that he moves the capital from the city of Rome, of course had long been the, for hundreds of years, had been the capital. He moved the capital of the Roman Empire to this place called Byzantium, renames it Constantinople, but that's why we call it the Byzantine Empire, because of that move, that shift. But here in the eastern part of the Mediterranean with the emperor Constantine, and then later on his sons, and then later on other successors who would serve as emperors, you know, how do they govern? How do they govern, particularly here in the eastern part of the Roman Empire? Well, you're, of course, going to have the, the, the emperor here at Constantinople, 
but in addition, he will, of course, have his court of uh, officials, different titles, prefects, and so forth, counts, and others. But then across the empire, you have to deal with the fact that you have these outlying areas. And especially as we focus on the east, everywhere down to Egypt, Palestine, Syria, all this area, area that today would be called Turkey, obviously Macedonia, Greece, over here. So how do you, as a centralized rule, how do you, how do you govern these areas? Well, one of the ways that they will draw officials to serve in the different positions, from the imperial court to the provincial governor, all the way down to the local, the, the small towns and sometimes the cities across the regions, there will be different ways that individuals will earn uh, promotions to these positions and serve as basically part of this provincial administration. Now, historically, in, West, in, in the western part of the Roman Empire, and to some extent in the east, just having you know, the right family connections and certainly oftentimes like military success, that could be kind of a recipe for promotion to, to rise up the ranks uh, of the imperial provincial gover government. But by the time we come into the, th to the 300s, one of the primary ways we're going to see for an individual to gain status and ultimately to gain oftentimes uh, a position within the government was through what we call paideia. So I want us to talk for just a couple of, minute, a couple of minutes about provincial administration and the education of young men. Now, paideia is a term, and this had been around all the way, this, this idea of Greek education had been around all the way back to the ancient Greek city-states of places like Athens and, and Thebes and so forth. I mean, it was a, a long-standing uh, ideal about what's going to be the, the source of great leadership and really just the source of excellence uh, in the ancient uh, Mediterranean world. But, but Paideia, and, and a person, so, so Paideia is going to be a system of training, a system of education. And even though this goes all the way back to ancient Athens and some of those ancient Greek city-states, Still, in the fourth century, because in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, this whole area was still steeped in the tradition of ancient Greece in terms of lit liter uh, literary leadership or political leadership, education. The whole world was, was in many ways, looking back to the, the Greeks of you know, yesterday, uh, the yester uh, days of lore. And with Paideia, Paideia, even in the fourth century, and by the fourth century, we, we mean the 300s, even at this time, across the eastern part of the Roman Empire in these towns and cities, as diverse and as provincial outline areas as they might be, the way that you became a person of high status and potential political office, influence, whether and it could be, you could be a person of influence as a teacher, as a local official, there were various ways, but to become a person of status, you essentially, you had to undergo this training in Paideia. And we could spend all of our time just talking about Paideia. And just a Pepa Dumenos is just a person who had undergone that training. It's a long, it's a mouthful, but that's just a person who's undergone that, that education. But the idea behind this in uh, the Eastern Roman, the Byzantine Empire, was that if someone, and this is for young men, the young men from provincial aristocracy, so it's not for everybody, all right? It's a limited group with the resources to pay teachers to train their children, their young men, to grow up to become you know, these ideal leaders with certain characteristics. And so the curriculum of Paideia, it, it's, it's, it's pretty diverse, all right? It involves everything from uh, the study of what you would expect, study of philosophy, Greek philosophy, study of philosophy, grammar, literature, history, music, um, arithmetic, uh, and above all of these, I would say, really bigger than anything uh, that I just mentioned was really studying and mastering the art of rhetoric. Okay. Rhetoric is the ability to use words, whether written words or spoken words, to inform, to teach, to influence. And so this is going to be, has, had long been kind of part of the, just the, 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 the fabric of Eastern Rome. And especially as we come into the fourth century, it's still going to re remain one of those really crucial skill sets. And so young men would learn this uh, growing up. They would acquire these skill sets. But it wasn't just the intellectual disciplines, the, what, what you and I would call the intellectual disciplines. They also, they also would study, no, I say study, they would participate in physical activities like wrestling, running, boxing, a little boxing, and of course, gymnastics. And even though that goes back to the original idea, again, uh, back to classical Greece, classical Athens, that to become a truly well-rounded 
great person, and especially a great citizen, you had to be well-rounded, not just in your intellect, but also in your physical self. It all went together, all right? It's, there's no separations really between the intellectual and the physical. It all works together to make the complete man. And of course, keep in mind too, that this also has its roots in the fact that the ideal citizen is going to be a hoplite soldier. So you can't just have it up here, right? If you're going to have to go and fight against, right, the Spartans or whoever, you better be in tip-top shape, not just up here, but also physically speaking. And so even though we get to the fourth century, there's not nearly as much emphasis on the actual physical, like the actual boxing. There'll be some of that. There will be more emphasis on the rhetoric. There will always remain kind of embedded in the idea of Paideia. There will always remain kind of that element of the physical, the, uh, what I would call just the toughness, the, uh, the sense of exertion, the, uh, the sense of sweat even. That will remain a big part of that. And that it goes along with two points that are related uh, to Paideia. One, is really at the heart and soul of paideia, what is, is what is called a gum. And that's just a Greek word that means uh, competition or contest. And the way that you excelled, the way that you became a great person, and remember they're trying to cultivate young men to become the ideal citizens, the ideal leaders of their communities. And kind of the end goal, the Greeks had a word for it, they called this arete. And arete could, has a number of different meaning so you, different scholars interpret it differently but essentially in this context we could call it excellence or or virtue but i'd say even more specific in this particular context i think it really is referring to the idea of the excellence that's going to make a young man into a a great uh, leader a great civic leader that's the essence in this context but to acquire that sense of excellence to become right the complete man so to speak you have to undergo competition. And this means competition in music, competition in philosophy, competition in rhetoric. That's, that's probably going to be the foremost field that we see people going, you know, butting heads is in the field of rhetoric. But that's what will make one um, a great person, a complete, uh, a complete citizen, all right? With this as background, and that's a lot of background, I know, and I'm trying to keep an eye on time because I want us to spend more of our time looking at the actual text, if possible. So let's fast forward then, our subjects the Cappadocian. Now, uh, the Cap first of all, don't be ashamed. Who's heard of the Cappadocians or the Cappadocian? Dr. Pig, of course. <laughs> the first hand goes up. I see, I see a few others. I'm a little, a little surprised that not more, and that's perfectly fine. I wouldn't expect you to necessarily, but the Cappadocians sometimes, well, I'll introduce you. I don't have pictures yet. I'll show you a couple of, a few pictures. Sadly enough, there weren't too many pictures on public domain. I decided I wasn't going to spend hours. I figured they'd be, ever, apparently, other people don't know about the Cappadocians. It's shocking. I, but they've been, like, they've been my best friends for about nine years, so I don't know why other people don't know them. But the three are uh, Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, Basil of Caesarea, and Gregory of, of Nyssa. All right, and you see the dates, when the approximate dates about when they lived. And they're called the Cappadocian Fathers in part because each one, at one point, served as a bishop at a town or city here in uh, the Roman province of Cappadocia, all right? And I'll try to locate them very briefly. I'm gonna to try to keep the, the context uh, somewhat to a minimum, minimum, but they all would serve as a bishop. That's why they're called, partly why they're called the Cap Cappadocian Fathers. But they're also called the Cappadocian Fathers, and these are just a few images of Cappadocia. Uh, I find it a beautiful place, but some would say it's definitely a rather, when you use the word provincial, it's a fairly remote place, uh, somewhat isolated from other parts of the Eastern Roman world because of the Taurus Mountains and other geographical uh, out outlines. But uh, a beautiful place. It reminds me of Utah, frankly, and I like Utah. All right, so there's another reason, though, why uh, I would say probably, first of all, 90% of the people, like, in, say, in Martin, I'm going to guess 90% of the people who have heard of the Cappadocians or the Cappadocian Fathers probably are either from the Orthodox Christian faith or the Catholic Christian faith. That's going to be much more likely and because how instrumental they are within that, the context of those fellowships. But there's also the element of when most people, I think, especially outside of academia, when they think about the Cappadocian Fathers, they don't think so much about what we're going to talk about today in terms of their letters and kind of their, their what I call verbal sparring. Uh, most people are probably going to think about their role in 
the theology of Christianity in the fourth century. And it's so easy for us to go down this and start talking about this because this is, they were huge, huge, particularly in the defense and promotion of what we call the Trinitarian doctrine. Now, I'm not going to go into this because we could go on forever on this, but I would say most people, even people in here who are not Christians or know very little about Christianity, Christianity I'm guessing you probably have heard about the, the Trinity, all right? And we just, I think, in Christianity today, Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the, the huge majority of Christian movements across the world today, they believe in the idea of the Trinity, all right? But that was never a foregone conclusion. Now, all three of the Cappadocian fathers, as we call them, were huge uh, defenders, and I would say uh, they, were, they were successful in promoting and extending this idea within Christianity across the fourth century, namely the, the late fourth century. But the idea of the Trinity, just in brief, is the idea that there's the, certainly the one, what we call the Godhead, and you have the three parts of the, the three persons of the Godhead, and I think you'll be familiar with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But again, without going into too much detail, what we, what we see with the Trinitarian doctrine, Trinity, uh, the Trinity or the Trinitarian doctrine holds that all three are divine, all right? God the Father is divine, the Holy Spirit is divine, so is God the Son, all right? And all three are co-eternal. That is, there was never a point at, when, at which they were not. Not even sounds very philosophical, right? But the point is, that sounds like, okay, well, that's sounds like kind of minutia, right? That's kind of boring. People got up in arms about that. Well, yeah, they got up in arms a lot, all right? The fourth century was just a bloodbath. Not literally, well, sometimes it was a bloodbath, but more or less it's more of a, more of a rhetorical bloodbath because there were huge battles fought amongst Christian groups. And there, you know, were, there were many who believed that, for, exa for example, that the Son, God the Son, was not fully divine, that there was a time when that he actually was created, and therefore that had all kinds of ramifications for how Christians would understand their relationship to the divine and to God. God the Father and God the Son. We won't get into that, but the point is, it was largely the work of the Cappadocians that would reinforce what had already been established in the year 325. We call this the Nicene Creed. That's basically where we first see an imperial kind of supported document, what we call a creed, that would outline the, the tenets of this Trinitarian doctrine. But even though it was established in the year 325, this did not become like official, actual, actual church teaching until the Council of Constantinople uh, in the year 381. And the reason that's important is, now Basel himself actually died, sadly enough, died two years before the Council of Constantinople, but he had done all kinds of work to defend and to promote the idea of the Trinity. But Gregory of Nixa and Gregory of Nazianzus, they were huge and played a huge role here at the Council of Constantinople, as well as leading up to it. So all three are, are huge. In, the idea of defending uh, the Trinitarian doctrine. And so scholars usually re refer to them as the pro-Nicene the, the pro bishops because they supported the doctrine, the creed of Nice uh, Nicaea, all right? So what does all this have to do then? And by the way, here's just real quickly some images of, this is actually from uh, the Hagia Sophia Church in Kiev. I had to find what I could get, right, for public domain. Uh, here's Basel. Uh, he came from, this is called Mazaka, which actually is the same city as uh, Caesarea in Cappadocia. Uh, this is uh, looking down at, it's the modern day city of Kaiseri, and you're looking at down it from an ancient Roman road. Where's Dr. Garlitz? Dr. Garlitz, that's Omer, our guide from 12 years ago when we did a travel study. You know him, Omer Elfie there. Uh, but here, Gregory Nixa, uh, Gregory Nazianzus. Now, Gregory Nazianzus, to show you where he's from, he's from, it's not even on the map here. Well, no, I'm sorry, I got myself lost here. He's going to be closer to right around uh, this area here. Um, also, I'm sorry, a little bit farther west here, near Mazika. And this is all that remains of Nazianzus, all right? I mean, it was even remote. It was remote in the ancient world. It's in incredibly remote now. And then here is Gregory of Nisa, and Nisa was near there, a little bit north. Uh, again, not terribly far uh, from Caesarea, but these, again, outline areas. Uh, I took this shot. I'm on top of a tell, an unexcavated part of an ancient settlement. And so this area right here is all that remains. Again, most, uh, I talked um, to some of the locals, and most of them 
didn't even know that there had actually been a city there. Uh, that's how old. I mean, the Turks didn't have a whole lot of use uh, for this area uh, when they conquered this um, in the, well, I think this was around the, the 10 hundreds. Um, so our main topic today, verbal sparring. So when we talk about verbal sparring, we're talking specifically about the written word. We're not going to get into, there wasn't as much in the way of this verb like actual oral oratorical combat. Now, that had been part of the ancient classical Greek world. They had actually gone face to face. I mean, the idea of Dan, Dan McDonough, not this Dan McDonough, but this Dan, you and I, like you would train and you would get up and you would have some kind of fancy speech and you would probably attack me and have a lot of criticisms and basically show off. And then I would respond to you in kind, just kind of literally verbal combat. Okay, and there's not as much about, of that going on in the fourth century, but what I argue in, in my book is that that culture of kind of verbal combat is going to translate into the written text. And this goes back then to our idea about how do they administer, how do they govern across the eastern part of the Roman Empire? Well, we talked about how up in Constantinople you'll have the emperors, and then you have you have the court of the emperors, then you'll have the, the provincial governors all around, and, but then you have these local officials, these kind of these members of the civic provincial aristocracy. So how do they, how do you handle, manage such a vast kind of government apparatus? Well, of course, you know, you do it through the written word. You do it through letter writing, all right? And in this case, if you look at this, this, there are hun not hundreds, I'm sorry, tens of thousands of these that would have been written. These are just, that's just a letter. Now, uh, most that survive, of course, come from Egypt, right? The climate, right, allows the papyrus uh, to survive. But this was the way that they interacted. Uh, governors, civic officials, the imperial court, they interacted through the written word, and they did it through letter writing. And a lot of the letters, there are all kinds of letters, There are all kinds of letters uh, from the fourth century, and some of them are just, they're just very basic. I mean, it's, it's one, to take the case of the bishops, you may have one bishop writing to this church over here and saying, okay, you, I've heard that you're teaching a questionable doctrine over here. You need to do this. So it could be like that. Or it could be just a general letter, of a, a non-Christian. It could be somebody, a local official writing to another official saying, uh, okay, our supply of olives um, is down. Can, can you uh, send some olives our way? I mean, these are like legitimate kinds of concerns. So you have all kinds of forms of correspondence. And when we talk about the Cappadocians or the Cappadocian fathers, uh, when it comes to the written word and to letters, we have a ton of letters. Uh, in the case of Basel, there are over 300 surviving letters. So we know all, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, lens that, that allows us to see what life was like on a lot of different levels in the fourth century, across a lot of different places uh, in the Eastern uh, Roman Empire. Gregory of Nazianz has had around, I think, 270 or so. Sadly, Gregory of Nyssa only has about 30 that have survived. Uh, we don't really know all the reasons for that, but in my opinion, he's like one of the best letter writers out there uh, of, of, the, of the three. So it's kind of, to me, it's sad that only a few of his survive. But we're going to actually look at one of his, so, all right. Uh, so these letters, they become the, the way that people communicate. And the letters that we're talking about, the, the verbal sparring that we're looking at, this is just one, I would say, genre uh, of letter, all right? And keep in mind, the Cappadocians wrote, wrote all kinds of different kinds of writing, different genres, right? They wrote um, treatises on theology. They wrote what we would call saint slides, hagiography, and orations, of course, sermons. We could go on and on, but we're just looking at the letters. And we're looking at a specific kind of letter. And I think you'll see what we mean. They're looking at, we're talking about letters that they exchanged with fellow pepidumenoi, okay? So the point here to understand as we get ready to look at this letter is that the Cappadocians, they themselves came from that same training. They were from local provincial aristocracies, from families with, you know, deep pockets, right? They were well-educated. They had studied their classical Greek philosophy and rhetoric and music, they had all the skill sets, right? They were the well-rounded uh, Greek citizen. And so the letters that we're going to look at, and there are many, I forget how, exactly how many in their corpus, but we're going to look at just two examples, two examples. And I want us to start with this. Now, this is a letter, and this is actually 
un um, in most cases, we only have the, the letter by the bishop, by the Gregory Nazianz, this Gregory of Nyssa. We don't have the letter that came to them. We will just have the response, okay? It would be beautiful if we always had both, both parts of the interaction, but we don't. But in this case, this is one reason I wanted to show you, we actually, in one of the rare cases, we actually have documentation, the actual letter of the person that first wrote to Gregory of Nyssa, and we're, then we're going to see his response in just a moment. So let's take a quick look at this. All right, we're doing great on time. All right, let's read this. And you want to read it or you want me to? <laughs> I told, I have my two, these are my two go-to English. I, I figured English professors would be ideal. My voice has been a little iffy. They do, they study. That's, that's the kind of English department we have at UT Martin. We have professors who can read, at least. Yeah, let's, would you mind doing that just to save my voice and don't bar, bar, uh, bother with the Greek? And can you see it from where you are, Jeff? So don't bother with the Greek? Yeah, you're yeah. trying to well, butcher that? <laughs> no. Well, go ahead and decline no, it and I'm gonna talk, about <laughs> the, talk about the history of the term. Okay. No, this is, the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sounds like you're trying to show up. Um, and All this right. is Dr. Jeff Longacre. Yeah, free advertising. Uh, he's a James Joyce scholar. Okay. So, ju so just read the letter? Please. Okay. All bishops are like fish that are difficult to catch in a net. You don't, you don't like that voice? You I like that okay, voice right. a lot. But you, having surpassed others in eloquence, inspire a fear that you may somehow remain unmoved by my request. But now, dear sir, put aside your expertise and counter-argument and act out of generosity. Since we need rafters with which to roof the house, though another sophist would have said joists or stakes, preening himself with fine little words rather than accommodating himself to the need, do agree to the gift of several hundred. Of course, if you wanted to cut them from paradise, you have the power to do so. But I, unless you furnish them, will be spending winter in the open air. So have a big heart, kind sir, and send a letter to the presbyter of Oceana ordering the gift. All right. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Longacre. Can you give him? Absolutely. So that was beautiful, actually, a beautiful reading. And I, I like this. Uh, I, I, of course, most of these letters I like, but this is one of my favorites of, of again, the fact that we usually don't have the, the one person. We just usually have Gregor Nyssa or Nazianzen responding. So first of all, quickly, a sophist. Uh, fascinating figure, all right? Going all, again, all the way back to classical Greece. Sophists, there was kind of an ambivalence about sophists. Uh, they, were, they were noted to be outstanding teachers, especially teachers of the spoken word, to some degree the, the written word as well. And they had, at one point they had dabbled, you know, they had taught philosophy and other disciplines, but their true, right, their two call, true uh, call to fame was in mastering the art of the spoken word. And, but the, the thing about sophists, though, and sophists, by the way, they were very important because they were the ones that would teach, oftentimes would teach the, the young men that would develop into these, you know, cultivated leaders of arete. So they, they, you could have a very highly, highly respected, venerated almost sophist, but there were other sophists that had that, they had that reputation for being a little bit maybe duplicitous. Right. They were big into, they, they like to use fancy words and, and twist around arguments. They do anything, right, to win an argument, to make their point, to make their case. All right. So they, they, you could, they, it was a profession that was very, very important, but also very, uh, I, was, I would say, highly susceptible to criticism and suspicion. All right. So with this in mind, this is coming from a sophist. Does anything stand out? I want to open this up to the audience. See what you all think about it. Is there anything that you heard that stands out to you that might give you some insight into what this Stagirius is saying uh, to Gregory? All bishops are like fish. We can start off with this. All bishops are like fish that are difficult to catch in a net. Well, how about if I just take this one then? <laughs> Is that all right? <laughs> Let's do this, all right? All right? So no one's jumping in. Hey, it took me a long time to, to make sense of this letter myself, especially with the interpretation that I'm going to give you at the end. It took especially a long time. So, uh, yeah, I struggled with this myself. But one, one point to understand is this Greek word, 
uh, discrete bisson right here. Okay, it's not a, a widely used word at this, in the fourth century. All right, it's just it's fairly obscure, and like a lot of Greek words, it, it's it could have a number of different meanings. But in this case, what it's saying it it is a, it's a fishing term. Where's Tate? There you go, Tate. You'd like this? It's a fishing term, and so it has to do with with uh, it, it's a, a, someone who's discrete bisson. It's 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 like a fish. It, it's like fish, like think of bass. Bass are hard to catch, right? Because they're going to jump off the, the hook and do everything they can to get loose. Well, it's used in that sense, but it also had a kind of a connotation that maybe a person who didn't want to like give up any, like spend money or give up any of their resources. In other words, words to put it nicely, you're a little parsimonious, maybe a little, a little strict or kind of careful about what you gave away. And so it's kind of, what he's doing, he's kind of taking a dig. Here, all right. There's kind of this underlying suggestion that it could be taken as it's talking about. You know, you're you're kind of evasive, is what he's saying, and you're going to be hard. I'm about to put forward a request, and I have a feeling it's going to be hard to, to get this from you. He's basically saying that. Um, I'm going to fast forward a little bit for Tom's sake, but he's remember he's a sophist. He's an artist of words. He's known to twist words, you know, to to get his way, and so he's always going to be suspicious or suspect because he's a sophist. So, but he seems to be kind of disarming himself before he asks for his favor. It's almost like he's trying to say, uh, look, I, I know you think you're suspicious about me, that I'm going to try to manipulate you or, or uh, man manipulate you into granting my request because of my you know, verbal skills. But no, I just have a simple favor. And so he's kind of dismissive. He tries to defend himself against some of the, the charges of his sophistries. He says, I could have said, Use another sophist would have said joists or stakes. It says preening himself with fine little words rather than accommodating himself to the need. And again, we don't see this so much in the English, but in the Greek, you have, it's kind of a wordplay, almost the, the, the kind of the meter and, of course, the, the similar sounds of kamikos or karakos. There's kind of a, a little, little bit of a literary wordplay there. So that's something that a sophist would have done. We try to play up this kind of this literary kind of, of um, exhibition. But he's saying, I'm not going to say that. I could have been fancy and said it this way. Of course, what does he do? He does say it that way. Right? <laughs> he does say it that way. So he's, I don't, I don't want to show off, so I won't show off, but I'm showing off, right? So he does that, but, but I'm not really a sophist, right? I just want this, we just need this. And so he goes forward and then he says, essentially, um, I, I need basically the, the basic gist is I need rafters for the house. And I, like, I love this part. Of course, if you wanted to cut them from paradise, you have the power to do so. This I love. Uh, if, if it's what, I, I don't know 100% if I've got the interpretation right, but I think I do. And what I think he's saying here is he's saying more or less, he's kind of, first of all, Sigurius is a non-Christian. He's not a Christian, okay? He's a, he's, a, he's a sophist. He's a great teacher, but he's not a Christian. And I think what he's saying here, I think he's kind of making fun, sort of making fun of, of Gregory of Nyssa as a bishop. I mean, after all, you're a holy man. You're a member of the church, right? You're a great, great prelate in God's church. So find your little sacred store of rafters, wherever it is, cut one out of paradise, or cut a few out of paradise, and then send them to me. You know, that's what he's saying. And then he goes on, he says, uh, unless you furnish them, by the way, I'll be spending the, the winter in the open air, you know. And he goes on, he's, you know, he, at the end he says, have a big heart, kind sir, and send a letter to the presbyter. Now, Oceana was the community here uh, nearby. It's, it's not in Nisa, but it's not far away. And so he, say, he says, there's a church leader there, a presbyter. That at this time, there were many church leaders. A presbyter was, was underneath the, the lead bishop, okay, in this context. So he says, send a letter and, and get him to order the gift, okay? And so that's the, that's the sophist. And so the sophist is trying to say, I'm not a sophist. I'm not a sophist. I need this. But all the while, he's pretty much, he's playing the role of a sophist, right? All right, so here's Gregory's response. Dr. Hill. <laughs> Dr. Chris Hill. Dr. Chris Hill. All right, yeah. And your smaller print, you gotta get close, more words. <laughs> If making a profit is called catching in the net, and the expression has this meaning which your sophistic power is selected from the secret sanctuary of Plato, consider, dear sir, who is really more evasive, 
We who are staked by your epistolary palisade, or the race of sophists whose craft consists of living a toll upon words? For who among the bishops has imposed a tax on his words? Who has made his disciples pay fees? But this is what sophists plume themselves on. Putting up their own wisdom as merchandise, just as the harvesters of honey do with their honeycombs. You see what you are doing with the mysterious musical power of your words? You have roused even me, an old man, to skip about, and yes, you stir those who do not know how to dance, to dance! But I have ordered to be given to you who parade your Persian declamations, rafters of equal number with the soldiers who fought at Thermopylae, all of good length, and according to your Homer, long shadowing. The sacred Dios has solemnly promised me to deliver safe and sound, saying that he would send not 10,000 or 20,000 rafters, but just as many as the petitioner could use and would be serviceable to the recipient. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I think this, this presentation would be best if I just allowed these two to just read. I think it would be worth just, just hearing these two read over and over. It would be worth coming. So uh, this, this was, is Gregory's response. Uh, we don't know the exact date, probably the same year. Certainly transportation was not easy in Cappadocia, even though both the, he does come from Cappadocia and Tiberias. We don't know, but, but Gregory sends this response. All right, so first of all, we, we come to this first point. If making a profit, caridine uh, is called catching in, in a net, and repeat saying comes from the other term, it's just a, a derivative of that, Again, that idea of being kind of slippery, evasive. So if making a profit is called catching in a net, and the expression has this meaning which your sophistic power has selected from the secret sanctuary of Plato, consider, dear sir, who is really more evasive? All right, in this case, evasive, the way I interpreted this, you could also say who's really more focused on profit, on, on financial or material gain, right? Who's really the one? Right. And first, we'll come back to that point in a second, but first of all, let's get to immediately a little bit, you know, we saw that Stagirius takes a few digs at Gregory. Well, now it's turn about, right? Time for counterattack, right? So here's his attack. This is Gregory not really being a sophist, because he's a bishop. He's not a sophist. Yeah, he's going to use a kind of a classical kind of rhetorical device. He's going to kind of attack Stagirius, making fun of him, saying, Basically, he's saying that you've drawn this obscure term that we talked about, this not very common. You've drawn this from some secret sanctuary of Plato, okay? That's brilliant. I mean, he's, he's complimenting him, right? Only this never appears in Plato. This is a word that apparently uh, is so obscure that the point that Gregory is making to Stagirius, he's, he's mocking him, categorically mocking him, saying, yeah, you obviously, you went to a very precious source. He's basically saying, no one knows what you're, why are you use, using this bizarre word that no one even uses? Basically what he's saying, he's saying that you're just, you're being pretentious, right? You're, 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 you're being a true sophist, right? You're just showing off for the sake of showing off. You know, stop doing that, stop doing that. Uh, so he says that, and then again, in terms of this, who's really the evasive one? Who's the one who's more like consumed with making a profit, making a game? Is it, is it really, is it really uh, we, the bishops? Well, I ask you, all right, uh, who among the bishops has imposed a tax on his words? Who has made his disciples pay fees? But this is what sophists plume themselves on, putting up their wisdom as merchandise, just as the harvesters of honey do with their honeycombs. Of course, I'm glad to know that honey was expensive back then, too. <laughs> so that you learned that as well, but it's saying, you, know, you, you, you you use your job, right? You use all, all this, uh, your words and your vocabulary to make money. And you're calling me evasive or saying that I'm, I'm the one that's consumed with like making a profit. You're the, you're the money grabber, right? And so he, he goes on, and I like this part here. He says, you see what you're doing with the mysterious musical power of your words? You have roused even me, an old man, to skip about. And yes, you stir those who do not how to dance to dance, okay? The implication here is, okay, he's Gregory the bishop. He's not, in, you know, in theory, he's not a sophist, all right? He doesn't understand this culture. I mean, he's just a mere bishop doing the Lord's work. The real, and the reality is, of course, we know that he's a very sophisticated, uh, well-educated, uh, articulate uh, bishop. And so he's giving it right back to him, right? He's going right after, uh, right after Stagirius. 
But the point he says here is by saying, he's basically accusing Stagirius of using, it's almost like he's using magic or, or trickery. And that's kind of, the, a lot of times that's kind of one of the, the themes, the accusations that would sometimes be leveled against sophists, that they were so underhanded and deceitful. They were almost like, oh, like wit, there's witchery, the witchery of their words and sometimes how you could think about them. And so he's saying that basically you're using your, your, your sophist, sophistic kind of words and you're basically, you're, you're, you're having an impact on me. You know, he's saying that you can pretend not to be a sophist, but I see right through you. You're, you are true-blooded sophist, and you're even, I can feel the effects of your words even right now. So don't you tell me you're not a sophist. You're a sophist through and through. And this, we come then, but I have ordered to be given to you who parade your Persian declamations, rafters of equal number with the soldiers who fought at Thermopylae. Now, we'll continue in a moment, but what he's getting at here is, he's saying here, Persian declamations, that's about the most cutting, cruel, hateful thing you could ever say to a sophist. Because, and I know you know this, Dr. Garlis, in the ancient world, the Persians represented the absolute antithesis, the, the very opposite of what it was to be a noble, good Greek person. There are all, there's all kinds of baggage associated with the, the terminology of a Persian. I mean, that means, and we still today have kind of the elements of this West versus East kind of, of, of binary that goes all the way back to the ancient Persian wars against Greece. And he's saying, but he's basically say, making fun of him, again, uh, taking another, another dig at him by saying, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're being like a Persian, right? You're, you're, you're being way too showy, uh, way too, uh, Persia, Persians were famous for their luxury, indulging too much. And that's kind of the accusation here. So you're, you're acting like a Persian. So it's a terrible thing to say uh, in, in, in this kind of context. And then he finally says, and this is how, how I'm going to respond to you. I'm going to respond. I'm going to take the high road, and I'm going to give you the rafters that you need, and I will match them with the number. I will give you the number that come from uh, the same number as the soldiers who fought at Thermopylae. Now, not the 300 Spartans, but you had the Plataeans and others that made up around 10,000 or more. So he says, I'll send you 10,000, and if, if you need more, you know, I'll give you those as well. And then just to kind of like put the, you know, the final now, icing on the cake with this kind of like showing off and this kind of this dig at, at Stagirius, he says, and not only will I give these to, to you, but they, the rafters are such good length and they are long shadowing, okay? If you've ever studied Homer, you know that Homer's full of epithets, all right? These descriptions that play a role in the poetry and uh, the narrative. And so what happens, that's, this then is Gregory's response to Stagirius. And I think, I want us to go ahead and stop here just so we can have a few questions if we have time, we, and, and we may or may not have too much time. But what I wanted to say here as we kind of finalize, what is this verbal sparring all about? And what I wanted to say is that when I first studied this, I saw this and I thought, wow, boy, these two are going at it, you know. It's a good thing they're not together. It's a good thing it's letters and they're not together. It might be like a bloodbath in some kind of cage, right? So like WWF or something. But then, as you start to study this, and especially as you see in other correspondence, because Gregory will also correspond with Stagirius in other contexts, the other Cappadocians, oh, as I say the others, I know Gregory of Nazianzus will also interact with the, with the same sophist, the same teacher, Stagirius. And so what's happening here is, and I learned this, it took me a time to, some time to figure it out, but this is not, these are not two individuals trying to destroy each other. This, is, this verbal sparring is not about verbal destruction. Uh, there's something very different uh, going on here. Uh, what, what's going on here is they are engaging each other. And again, if you go back to we, what we talked about a few minutes ago, what really was the epitome of, what, what, what would give rise to that sense of excellence and virtue of arete? Well, it's competition. It's the agone, right? What we call the agone, right? What's going on here is they are staging through a letter, through verbal Verbal sparring, they are staging and agone, combat. It's kind of like verbal combat. But like the train that goes back all the way to classical Greece, they're not attacking each other just to destroy, they're attacking each other basically both for both to improve, to basically, it's, it's, it's a performance is what it is. It's an, it's an exhibition. And they're showing off. One is basically, uh, one's kind of shooting his sabot of 
words against the other. The other is going to respond in kind. All right. The idea is that they're both going to show off. And by doing this, they're really, in a sense, hearkening back to the ancient warriors that they both, of course, had studied all the way back, the Homeric warriors, but also just the whole, the whole spirit of combat and competition that goes back to the classical Greek world. They're kind of reenacting this here. And, and what you see then is far from dishonoring or dismissing the other, it's really a, a, a form. It allows both. Both parties now have the opportunity to kind of show off their identity, their authority. And I'll just go ahead and put this in our final point of the outline. Really, this relates ultimately to a sense of, I think I'm going the wrong way, aren't I? Yep. This comes down ulti ultimately to the issue of identity and authority. In a way, they're acting more like what you would expect Greek hoplites to. I mean, they're going you know, face to face. They're, 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 they seem to be fighting. But in this case, they're not literally fighting each other to destroy one another. They are very much, in a way, like Greek wrestlers, all right? Wrestling in the ancient Greek world, it was not about, it was about winning the match, for sure. But ultimately, it was not all about strictly a winner and a loser. Both become greater because of the exertion, right? The effort that goes into the exercise, into the, uh, into the contention. And as part of this, what ultimately this does is it's, it's going to present a form of honor for each one. Uh, in, in a real sense, this is going to promote the identity of each. This is kind of a way of what we would call social signaling. Uh, because keep in mind, it's not just going to be the two people that read these. These will circulate, these letters will circulate to many different groups across the Eastern Roman Empire. And when they do, this is going to be like an announcement, like a calling card, that these are persons of significant training. They uh, have significant, they have confidence, they have boldness, they are assertive. And basically, they are, they are the ideal male of the fourth century. That's essentially what these letters are going to advertise. And this will play a role in everything from interacting with other provincial officials, civic officials, imperial officials, but it will also play a role in the politics of the church. This kind of this, this standing, this, this social status that comes about through this. And, and one point I wanted to end with, well actually a couple of quick points, is what we see here, it's a, a great example of also of a civil dialogue. You have non-Christians interacting with Christians, and there's a very respectful way that they go, go about interacting. Now, it's going to be only those that belong to that category that we call the pepa du men, menoi, those that come from that particular training. But within that context of honor, that kind of this basically an affair of honor, an affair of respect, uh, they're going to show great, a great deal of mutual regard. And as I close out, just one quick passage from the book uh, that regards this, this issue, and I think we will close out. If you'll listen to this, I, I think this will kind of make the, the final point about how this relates, this verbal sparring relates to identity and authority. Through verbal sparring, the Cappadocians reinscribed the heritage of agon, of competition, of contest, subsequently integrating the ideals of classical manhood into the collective consciousness of the church and identifying them within the pro-Nicene church. Through epistolary exhibitions, the Cappadocians promoted a masculine persona that harked back to the heroes of an idealized Greek past. By compelling Pepidomenoi to compose letters and by holding up certain values embedded in Greek lore, they were forging a convergence of clerical authority and masculinity. While refreshing, I'm sorry, while refashioning arete that was visible in figures from ancient Greek literature, the Cappadocians upheld attri attributes that complemented the character of bishops outlined in scriptures, such as the emphasis on temperance and self-control in 1 Timothy and Titus. In doing so, they made it clear that the classical male ideal aligned with pro-Nicene visions of church guidance. All right. Thank you so much for your attention. I think we do have time for a couple of questions. <laughs> and by the way, if you have questions afterwards, we need, we'll keep this rather short, but I'll be glad to talk to anybody who wants to stay around afterwards. Oh.
Dr. McCune. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so hear me fine, right? Okay. So, so Dr. McCune's question was, basically, I'm going to summarize it, was do they, do they just, is there a point where this, there's a terminus to this kind of dialogue, or do they, is this kind of an ongoing kind of, of, of discussion and, and competition and contest? Um, and to answer, I'm not going to, to give the long, but I'll go back. We were going to read one. Notice this letter that we didn't get to, and uh, just real quickly, the first part says, what should I say that you have against me, O oh admirable man? What is your reason for not writing? Dr. McHugh, kind of getting to your point in this other letter, this, it, the, the short answer is they will keep writing as long as, as they can. I mean, they will try to keep up the correspondence, partly because it's a, a, way, uh, it, it's a way to promote your identity and your authority. And it's not like there was like a, an end to, okay, I've established my credentials, I'm now this respected leader. You have to do it over and over and over. You have to do it, it's like a constant kind of battle to maintain your image. And so what letter writing does, it's, it's kind of considered, it's, it's not too showy for, for some reason, they, well, there's a reason for it, but when you are too eloquent or you're, the way that you speak from uh, orally is it, sometimes considered to be too, uh, too arrogant in some ways, but you can show off more in the written word a little bit. But that's why they will, you see this recurring trope, they over and over, hey, why haven't you written me? Send me letters. And they're not just saying that. I mean, there's a rhetorical element there, but they're mainly saying, keep writing, keep writing, and keep, you know, and they love this, keep dropping your Homeric illusions, drop one from Euripides and from Aristophanes and show off. And once you do that, then I'll come back. The idea is I'll come back with a response and basically, it's going to result in honor for both of us. So, absolutely. Um, do you want me to choose? Okay. Uh, uh, Doctor, uh, 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 boy, yeah. Uh, let, me, let me get uh, this. Ms. Sawyer's back here, and I'll come back to these two, right? If that's cool. Corey Sawyer's. I think that's part of it. He's saying that um, you, he, he's leaving there. If Greg, the worst thing Gregory of Nyssa could have done is if he had written a short response and said, without the, kind of these cutting remarks, you know, kind of like attacking, so to speak, attack, I say attacking him. If Gregory had said, oh, certainly, I will send you the rafters as soon as possible. I'm sending this to this presbyter. You'll have them within two months, right? And he said, like a three lines. That would have been the ultimate insult. Ultimate. If he hears that, that's a sure sign there's something wrong. There is a fracture in the relationship. And they, you will actually hear, and you will hear them refer to that sometimes, say, Gregory Nazianzus in particular will say that. He'll say to certain recipients, I haven't heard from you in a while. What have I done? You know? And so they're very aware of that, for sure. And so, absolutely, keep it coming, keep it coming. Can, can I come to, to, do we have time, uh, Dr. Dorber? Yeah, to, okay, one more. one more. Oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, are you sure? Okay, thanks. Uh, Shane Tanner. Yeah. Sure. Great question, Shane. So it's, this just happened, the, the, the two individuals I chose today happened to both be from Cappadocia, just because I wanted to, to give you what, one, of, one of my favorite examples. But actually, they're, all, they're almost all, there are a few that will go all the way to Western Rome. I can't remember any that are outside of the Roman Empire itself, but they are all over the Eastern part of the, you know, from Constantinople to Alexandria to Antioch, so absolutely. They, they span all parts, so it's not just a local. But of course you would expect them to be, take longer to, to reach their destination. Yeah, thank you. Great, I'm gonna invite others to come up and uh, talk to Dr. Howard. We do also have some copies of his book uh, for sale over on the side here, uh, and uh, you might be interested there. And I know that Dr. Howard will be more than happy to write <coughs> a personal inscription to you uh, in a copy that you Again, I want to thank all of you for coming out, but I'm hoping that you'll help me thank Dr. Howard. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.